so you're not encouraged to actually uh, show the, the proof at that moment, and in nope. fact, you probably should not. Well, it, it just means that you'll be telling the story twice if you do that. <laughs> so, because eventually you'll have to get in the witness stand, because it's only from the witness stand. Well, technically, it is not only from the witness stand. As a deputy judge, I can accept as evidence anything that is said in the courtroom. Oh. But most deputy judges do not. These days, our limit is $35,000. Right. That's a lot of money. If you want judgment for $35,000, you're going to give me sworn evidence from the witness stand. I'm not going to accept something that you say in the well of the court, right? I'm not going to accept that and rely on it. So I ask people to get in the witness stand, even people at assessment hearings. I ask them to get in the witness stand and uh, either swear or affirm to tell the truth. And then if it's an assessment, I ask a series of questions to set out the facts. Um, if it's a full trial, I ask, or the other, uh, pardon me, I ask if they're unrepresented, a series of questions to get the story in a way that gives the facts that will support what they're saying. Right. right? Yeah. It's quite active when you judge in small claims, much more so than, than the other branches of the Superior Court. That's true. That is really interesting because I know in law school, we, we are told <laughs> we learned that uh, trial judges tend to be very quiet during mm. the, uh, the trial and they're really not supposed to interfere or jump in or that kind of thing. But yeah, so go ahead. Yeah. Again, that's true if there are representatives, uh, right? If I have two paralegals or two lawyers, mm -hmm. um, I leave it to them to lead the case, what we call lead the case, right? I don't interfere with the way they want to call witnesses, with who they want to call, with the documents they want to put in. If there's something wrong with what they're doing, I rely on the other lawyer or the other paralegal to object, right? right. When it comes to self-represented litigants, if I have two self-represented litigants, I can't wait for a self-represented litigant to object because they might not know that what's happening isn't acceptable right? Some will, some won't. Wow. And if they do, great. But if they don't know, then I should say, you know, have you, for example, the, the biggest problem we run into is that because of television, I think, people tend to hold back what they consider to be the most important document, right? Instead of sending it to the other side <laughs> and sharing it so everybody has a copy, they right. tend to hold it back, hoping right. they can spring it on the other person. Yeah. And, you know, uh, the first thing I will say, when somebody pulls a document out, when a self-represented litigant pulls out a document, I will say, have you shared that with the other side? <laughs> right. Because otherwise, I can't take it. Mm -hmm. And that's what people don't understand. I can't take it if they haven't given it to the other side. What do you do in those situations? Do you tell them, okay, uh, let's say that I were the self rep who didn't realize I'm supposed to share it and I thought I could do a surprise attack like, like I see on television. Do yeah. you, what, do you, um, what, what am I supposed to do then? Do I just lose the chance of admitting that important document or, do, or would you allow me to serve it to the other side like right now and then we can argue about it? Like how, what happens? You are supposed to serve all the documents you're going to show the judge. And I mean everything. Right. If you think, as you go through all the documents when yeah. you're preparing your case, yeah. if you see so much as a bus ticket that you think you'll want to show the judge, just copy it and give it to the other side. If you don't use it, yeah. no harm is done. If you want to use it, you need to have given it to the other side at least 30 days before the trial begins. Right? right. So usually I will give people a choice or let's put it this way. It was easier to do when we were in person. Okay. I would give people a choice and say, you can either complete your case without this document being admitted. Right. Or if you wish, we can adjourn for more than 30 days so that you can share it with the other side. Right. Now, if that happens when it's the person suing, the person who has been sued also gets the message. So the next time they come back, they'll be ready and they'll have shared all their documents. Right. But the general idea when you go to court, the idea is 
that everybody has exactly the same documents, right? And they have them all ready to use. And when I say everybody, I mean, you've brought a spare copy for the judge mm -hmm. because that's the person you're telling the story to. Right. There's not much point having all your documents yeah. if the judge is gonna see them one by one. So you might as well put in an extra package and say to the judge, would you like to follow along with this package of documents? Right. Right, then the originals will go in as, uh, as exhibits. Mm -hmm. And the package that the judge has, the judge will simply turn over as each document comes in. I know as lawyers, we're always so worried about the rules, right? Um, so uh, at a regular court case, we have to worry about the rules of civil procedure and the evidence act. Now in the small claims court, is it the same? Like you, and of course there's the small claims rules, which actually are not too bad. But um, do we, uh, do the lawyers have to worry about the evidence act as well? Nope. I like you're shaking your head. <laughs> nope. Section 27 of the Courts of Justice Act. Okay says I can take as evidence anything sworn or unsworn, right? I can take anything. The only things I can't take are things that have a statutory privilege. There are some statutes that say you can't use this document as a piece of evidence in a court case. One of those is the Registered Health Professions Act. You can't use, you know where, um, um, the College of Physicians and Surgeons right. might get an expert's report on a complaint that they get from a patient. Right. You can't use that report as evidence because the Registered Health Professions Act says you can't, okay. right. Right? right? So that's a statutory privilege. That's all it means is that some statute says you can't use this as evidence. Um, so I can't take that. I can't take something that uh, anything else. There's obviously I can't take solicitor client privilege of course. unless the client waives the privilege. Right. Um, but there's some other thing I can't take. But in general, I can take anything. And sometimes it's a little concerning. You know, we don't do this, but theoretically, all right. Theoretically, if someone opened the door at the back of the courtroom and yelled, that's not what happened, this is what happened, yeah. and then shut the door, I could take that as evidence, right? I wouldn't, wait, wait, but I could. <laughs> that you cannot take the opening statement from uh, the party as evidence, or, or can you? Maybe you can? I can, you can. Yeah. but I won't because it involves a lot of money okay. now, right? Back when it was a $1,000, oh. right? Or back when it was a $1,000, right. yes, by all means, just tell me your story from there. From the well. <laughs> from the well, right? right. Um, and you tell me your story from yeah. there. Yeah. Fine. It's not a $1,000 anymore. It's $35,000. Right. If you're suing somebody for $35,000 and they're suing you back for $35,000, right. that means there's $70,000 in play. That's a lot of money. Yes. Right? I mean, I, I, if I stumbled on something, a bag full of $70,000, I'd think I'd found a lot of money. Yeah. Right? So, and that, I think, is why now, although we can do that, Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay.